The Great Wall Motors Chinese Wrangler, also known as the Tank 300. Ladies and gentlemen, a small round of applause. Please be upstanding with trousers optional, as is Australian summertime convention. <laughs> They really have done an excellent job, in my estimation, putting together a vehicle that is almost, but not quite, not a complete piece of shit. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, Newcast Cheap, Australia only, website, card. Don't get me wrong, dude, this is not some sort of cheap hatchet job. But I would suggest if you are thinking about spending your own hard-earned cash on one of these almost not a complete piece of shit Tank 300 4x4 Wrangler rip-offs and then heading off into the sunset to see this great nation of ours, all that endless busted-ass scrub, the 20 most common different venomous snakes, the spiders, the stonefish, the saltwater crocodile, the great white shark, the box jellyfish, the fires, the general overall pestilence and resentment, Banjo University, etc. It really is Satan's summer house, Australia, but a lucky few do actually make it to the mythical golden billabong at the tidal confluence of Dingo Piss Creek. In their acoustically transparent, his and hers effluent tote and porter hovels, live in the frickin' dream. Imagine that. If you're thinking of experiencing this grand adventure, life truly on the edge, in a new Chinese Wrangler Tank 300, I've got two huge red flags for you to consider today. This prospect is just not the same thing as buying a Pajero Sport or an Everest, only cheaper. Like, it's just not, dude. Corners have been cut, and I would suggest that other bridges, there are bridges in the process of producing a vehicle that other manufacturers have crossed that GWM has not even freaking built yet. And against this inconvenient backdrop, there has been this full tilt, undignified motoring media gasm over this vehicle. There just has so much total video timeline time devoted to things such as those awesome central air vents, which look almost as if they might have come from a Mercedes. Imagine that. Goodness me, that's never happened before. Clean up in aisle one. And all those publishers in the background sniffing GWM's ass, you can hear it, like a bulldog on the scent. Like the fluffers they aspire to be, more like hoping a river of advertising gold is forthcoming from these mediagasm reviews. And people say motoring journalism is terminally ill and comprehensively bent over in Australia. Go figure. Today's two red flags make this vehicle a complete non-starter for me in the ownership prospect sweepstakes. And I strongly recommend you do not buy one. Details next. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Get four extra months of Nord free now at nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Say you're in a cafe one day and you think you've just connected to the free Wi-Fi. But in fact, a hacker has just inserted himself between you and the internet and he's about to start ripping you off properly. How would you even know? This is called a man-in-the-middle attack. It's one of the most common ways to get hacked. But there's no law that says you have to be the next victim. You need countermeasures, and that's what NordVPN does. NordVPN does the stuff that you and I don't understand in the background. Encrypting your data, hiding your IP address, locking everything down, basically. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now. 
The two-year plan discount is huge right now. Plus, you're going to get four extra months free. NordVPN.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. Just subscribe, download the app and connect. One click later, your IP address is shielded. Your online traffic is masked with NSA-level encryption across as many as six of your devices. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet. It costs only about as much as one cup of coffee every month to keep your data, your identity and your devices secure. Because your location is masked, you'll be able to access streaming and other services that might be blocked where you live. Plus, you can continue to watch your favourite content when you travel. You might even be able to score some great deals on travel and accommodation that are not available at home. That happens all the time. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now, boost your security and enjoy that discount plus those extra four months of free subscription time. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC, link in the description, and thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. Red flag number one for me is towing and especially with the hybrid. The Tank 300 actually has a conservative maximum tow capacity of two and a half thousand kilos. That's braked, obviously. Congratulations there. This is a very reasonable tow limit for a vehicle of this nature. Like the curb weight is about 2.3 tonnes. That's for the Lux hybrid, the top spec with the hybrid powertrain, right? There's nothing wrong with that, far more rational in my estimation than the ridiculous three and a half ton tow capacities that have proliferated on some competitors. And the hybrid is really interesting to me because regenerative brakes could be a real asset for towing on those long declines, taking some of the load perhaps off the conventional brakes and the transmission. So, yay. And the combined output of both powertrains, the combustion one and the electric one, 258 kilowatts and 615 peak newton meters. What awesome numbers for towing. So put yourself in this position. You read the brochure, which claims, among other things, that this vehicle's luxury, quote, knows no limits, and it's, quote, driven by a new energy and, quote, built to the safest standards and offers, quote, superior technology without compromise. And when you stop dry heaving and get to the back where the specs are, you figure out all of what I just said about the Tank 300 being the discount orgasmatron for towing your particular mobile slum in which you can take a pleasant dump at the head of the dining table in the middle of the kitchen, like the king you have always deserved to be. And then the salesman reaches around persuasively, and he grabs you metaphorically and quite suggestively on the arse, and suddenly you become the dude who can't say no. There's a signature on a contract, like how did that get there? And you've paid your deposit. Then you get home and a horrible bald has-been on YouTube tells you the following. <coughs> Dude, the gross vehicle mass of the Tank 300 Lux Hybrid is 2,725 kilos. The curb weight is 2,305, mainly because this is a somewhat heavy ladder-framed shitter. And it's got a big battery. That's 420 kilos of total payload when you take the big one away, or the small one away from the big one. When you hook up your two and a half ton slum on wheels with presumably 250 kilos on the tow wall download, your tank carries the download. It becomes part of the payload. So 420 minus 250 equals 170 kilos. And the tow bar, let's not forget, is an accessory, so it's part of the payload too, and I can't see that being less than about a 40 kilo proposition, so that leaves 130 kilos for people, accessories, and luggage, and all equipment. 
seems unrealistic. Like, dude, I was at Dingo Piss Creek in January of 1977 for the Ms. Golden Billabong pageant and competition won by Rosie Butts, who went on to inspire Angus and Malcolm Young and Bon Scott to write the second hit single from Let There Be Rock. Dude, you could say she had it all. 19 stone, that's what. 121 kilos. So Rosie's travelling solo in a Chinese Wrangler hauling a 2.5 ton chitwa, which seems rather a shame considering all the details. The point being, it's completely unrealistic to expect to tow at the maximum capacity in this vehicle. It's ridiculous. You can do it, but with two standard adults on board or one Rosie B and a few snacks for the trip, you're going to be overloaded. If you try the same exercise with a Pajero Sport GSR, for example, like the fully loaded Pajero Sport, you tow two and a half tons with 250 kilos of download and a 40 kilo tow ball, you get 276 kilos remaining for people, accessories and luggage. That's still a little light. It's going to be a tight fit, but it's more than double the allowance for all of those things that you get if you purchase a Tank 300 hybrid. And it's only $6,000 more for the Pajero Sport, plus the warranty is going to be longer and the resale value will almost certainly be substantially better. Ford Everest Wild Track now. Same exercise, two and a half tons, 250 kilos on the tow ball, 40 kilo, whatever, tow ball. 372 kilos remaining, which is nearly three times the allowance for people, accessories and luggage. That's you and Rosie and some stuff, dude. And yeah, that vehicle is a lot more expensive, like it's 17,000 bucks more. Red flag number two now. The braking performance is beyond appalling, like truly beyond appalling. This is a proper safety liability and you don't have to be towing something. It's just disgraceful. And I know it gets five stars. Like on safety, it gets five stars and they rab it on about no corners being cut without compromise, blah, blah, blah. And this five-star business in a vehicle that breaks like that, it is a huge indictment of the entire ANCAP process. Like how is that even possible? Like they test the autonomous emergency braking system at ANCAP, okay? But not the actual brake performance, not the stopping distance and the stability in those circumstances. Go figure. To me, that is functionally insane. But hey, that's just my opinion. And what the fuck would I know about that? There's an Australian motoring journal and YouTuber named Brett Davis, right? He's a good bloke. He's tough too. Like he survived working for me back in the day. Talk about a living professional hell. And then he started Performance Drive, which you may have heard of. This was years ago now. And now he's starting a brand new channel again. And this one's called Driving Enthusiast. So why am I telling you all this about Brett, okay? because he uncovered this appalling braking performance and then he published it. Hashtag respect. I'll put a link to Brett's new Driving Enthusiast channel in the description. You should go there and show him some subscriber love, dude, because he's a super genuine guy, quite capable. He's a former mechanic, so he knows how cars work and he's doing a pretty good job, I have to say. So... He's got the Tank 300 on test for a week, right? This one is a non-hybrid. And he's got access to this piece of private road in his neck of the woods. So he hooks up his V-Box and he runs the acceleration and the braking figures because this is what he does. And the braking distance from 100 is crap. It's like 40-something metres. That's not the end of this story, though. This is despite the vehicle coming standard on Michelins and highway biased Michelins too, not some crap no name tyres and not some mud performance specific off road tyres like the Raptor. Okay? So he investigates as to the why of this lengthy and somewhat undignified stopping performance and he finds this. It felt very funny or very unusual as I was doing the braking tests and the back of the vehicle rose right up off the, you know, to the point where it came off the ground. So I put the cameras, I put the GoPro under the vehicle 
just to double check, I attached it to the chassis just there. Um, and sure enough, yeah, the back wheels actually leave the ground. I ran the test in multiple directions and I put the camera on both sides as well, just to make sure that there was no, you know, little bump or something on the road. And yeah, both times, so four different occasions, the back wheel came off the ground by, you know, half a centimeter or something like that. We also ran some tests on regular public roads and at different speeds. That's really not supposed to happen, I'd suggest. I'll put a link to the full video up there and you can check that out. It's quite a long video, the best 10 and worst 10 things about that fundamental heap of crap. Wheels off the deck starts way towards the end at about 27 minutes in, okay? It's pretty good and Brett's pretty balanced about it. He hasn't burned every bridge yet, but like there's still hope. If you go frame by frame for those wheels off sequences, the rear wheels come off the deck for about 120 milliseconds, which is about an eighth of a second, okay? And it happens every time he does a full ABS activation emergency stop. So here's what physics says about that. A couple of obvious things. A. During the time the wheels are off the deck, they are unable to contribute to the braking process, obviously. That's because they're weightless and also they're not in contact with the road. And B. The car travels more than its own wheelbase at 100 k's an hour during the time the rear wheels are off the deck. When you look at why this is happening, okay, the brake application causes this massive pitch event. Like, the suspension is really soft in this car. And pitch is obviously, everyone's head nods forward because you're braking really hard. The front suspension therefore compresses, and because it's so soft, it looks to me like it runs out of travel. There's an impact event in the front suspension. Presumably, the bump stops become engaged and there's an inertial sort of impulse style impact in, in that process intrinsically, which lifts the rear wheels off the deck, right? Because the weight transfer is comparatively violent once the bump stops are engaged, there is this big lift at the rear, okay? That's the only explanation that I can come up with as to why this is happening. Let's leave what's happening to one side and concentrate on why does this matter. I'd suggest that emergency brake events often occur in the most non-ideal situations and conditions. And additionally, ordinary people don't train for emergency stops. Like I've done thousands, dude, but I don't know about you, and I've done them in hundreds of different cars. It's kind of an occupational hazard for me. Brett's done heaps as well. Racing drivers, other driving perverts, tend to do this kind of thing, brake really, really hard all the time. But ordinary drivers don't. So they are comparatively shit at it. And it happens completely out of the blue and they're untrained. It's kind of like getting mugged if you don't speak fluent violence. Imagine that, you know, when you're crossing the road next time, how pathetically crap ordinary people are at braking, or even worse, if you want to be properly terrified, how about the first time your kids go out on foot on their own and cross the road on their own? They are in this environment too. And the ability to brake is never even really tested in part of the driving licensing process. Go figure. So let's say in this against this backdrop, you are honking around an off camber sweeper on the highway at 100 one day, and then something happens. There's a kid just standing in the center of the road or kangaroo or some cattle, an overturned truck, whatever. Like, who cares, dude? It's just something that you really, really don't want to hit. Like ex-wives three and five, in my case, the sisters. So hot. Anyway... You slam on the brakes and the rear wheels come off the freaking deck and you're in a corner. So cornering force pushes the rear end out because it's floating momentarily and the mass centroid is somewhat behind the front axle and 
you probably don't train for skid control either, do you? So the point here is that I've been in plenty of cars with the wheels that come off the deck, okay? I just have. But I've never been in one that just managed it with such trivial provocation in the manner of this one. This really is bad. Usually you have to intend to get the wheels off the deck. And usually it's not all four at the same time. Usually it's not two at the same time. Occasionally on a racetrack it's one, right? Like that. But just hit the brakes and both rear wheels come off the deck. I've never had that on a production vehicle. This is a truly appalling lack of suspension tuning effort by Great Wall. It's an appalling lack of control of a foreseeable set of dynamic circumstances out there on the road. Like, this is, in my estimation, hang your freaking heads, appalling. It's not a one-off either. I note car expert identified the same behaviour on a completely different Tank 300 in their video review. So it's a systemic problem with this model and a complete safety liability in my estimation. And incidentally, it fully accounts for the vehicle's shit braking performance. Physics says the Tank 300 brakes like a piece of shit because the rear wheels cannot do very much braking. They can only brake in proportion to the weight which is on them and they're heavily unloaded for a lot of the total stopping time, not just the time they're completely weightless and airborne. The hardest thing I'd suggest for these emerging brands to get right is suspensions. Features like easy, they come off the shelf. You just buy them from a supplier. Powertrains and platforms are also comparatively easy to engineer, but suspension tuning is properly complex. And in many markets with lots of sales volume, often in Asia, the prevailing attitude of consumers, like actual car buyers over there, is near enough, is kind of good enough. I've seen this before too. Hyundai and Kia, when they were emerging brands, they eventually got to a point where they finally had developed vehicles that actually looked okay, miraculously enough. They were somewhat aesthetically challenging to begin with, let me say. They finally had competitive features also, and the engines and the powertrains were okay. But at that point, dynamically, they were still pretty much pieces of shit. And it took so much high-level diplomacy, like plus a bunch of highly critical independent reviews before the mothership over there in Seoul saw any merit whatsoever in improving the state of ambient suspension tune because this criticism was not forthcoming back at home. Ultimately, they both caved in and they took on independent local suspension tuning programs and they got the final piece to fit in the get your automotive shit together jigsaw. So if there's a line demarking the before and after phases of this automotive shit together jigsaw proposition, GWM's Tank 300 is well inside the before zone, at least in my estimation, based on its braking performance. This is something only they can decide to unfuck, incidentally. And that's why, in my estimation, it qualifies this vehicle as almost, but not quite, not a total piece of shit. And if I were you and Rosie, dude, I would probably abstain from heading off to Dingo Piss Creek or anywhere else in one.